today, as I was thinking about and praying about, God, what do you want to say to us about relationships? One of the, the big things that just came to my heart is I believe that God wants us to talk about overcoming temptation. Overcoming temptation. I have seen that giving in to temptation can literally ruin a marriage. It can ruin a relationship. I have seen single people, maybe you're a single person in this room, a part of this relationship series, but I have seen single people who have given into temptation and it has been really, really difficult and hard on them. And it has led to some self-destruction, if I'm honest. Temptation, it doesn't seem like a happy topic, but I tell you what, God wants to talk to us about temptation this morning. You know that Jesus thought it was such a big deal to talk about temptation in the scriptures that he put it in the most famous prayer in all the scriptures in Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. We're going to put this up on the screen. It says this, Lord, lead us not, in, or lead us not into temptation. temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I think we have to, before we talk about anything practical, about how to resist temptation, we have to recognize something. We have to recognize what Jesus said in this prayer. He said there is a real evil one. There is an enemy. There is a devil that is after you, that wants you to stumble, that wants you to give in to temptation. And we need not just to willpower our way. We can't willpower our way through temptation. We need the spirit of God. We need to understand that the Spirit of God that lives inside of us will give us the power, will give us everything that we need to overcome temptation. Amen? And so this morning, I want you to recognize that while we'll do some practical things, we have got to first identify that we have an enemy that's trying to lead us into temptation to destroy our lives. And what happens when we give into temptation? Well, we give into sin. And when we give into sin, sin leads to to death. Look at James 1.13. says this, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their, ev- by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Giving into temptation leads us to sin, which leads us to death. And we have an enemy A real enemy is a spiritual battle that we need to take into consideration as we uh, come against our temptation. So how do we overcome them? How do we overcome temptation? I want to tell you about a story in the scriptures, a man named Joseph. And uh, Joseph is in Genesis chapter 39. And this guy was a baller at resisting temptation. Okay, like he just did an incredible job. I want to set this up for you and then we're going to read the story. Joseph uh, was the youngest of 12 brothers, okay? And his brothers, if you remember this story and if you're new to this story that's okay he was the youngest of 12 brothers and his brothers betrayed him and they literally sold him into slavery and Joseph didn't know if he would ever see his family again I mean this is a real traumatic situation in his life and what happens is Joseph actually ends up being purchased by a man named Potiphar and Potiphar was uh, one of Pharaoh's right hand men Okay, and so basically Pharaoh takes care of Joseph, brings him into his house and puts him in charge of his whole household. Let's pick up in Genesis 39, 6 so you can see this. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was like Pastor Pradeepin. He was well built and handsome. He's not even here to hear this. Bummer. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Verse 10. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day, he went inside the house. He went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. This is a crazy story. 
Joseph is literally been given just a bunch of power and authority. I mean, Potiphar is just said, I trust you, man. Like, you're here in my house. Thanks for taking care of stuff. And Potiphar doesn't realize that his wife is literally trying to seduce and entice uh, Potiphar's, or, and, and to seduce and uh, entice Joseph to sleep with her. And this woman would not relent that we see in this scripture. And I, listen, I know how guys think, okay? I don't know how this guy resisted, okay? And I mean, this was crazy. Listen, Joseph, contextually, when he was sold into slavery, he was 17 years old, okay? And then, if you read through the scriptures, when he was actually, uh, became even more powerful, he became uh, uh, Pharaoh's right-hand person. He actually uh, surpassed Potiphar. This is way down the road. When that happened, he was about 30 years old. So that means that Joseph lived in Potiphar's wife for anywhere to 10 to 11 years. That means that for 11 years, this woman tried to seduce him and get, her, get him to sleep with her for 11 years. Now, if this man could refuse and resist temptation for 11 years, I think we can learn something from him. How about you? So we're going to study this today. Uh, and I want to start off by just telling you a story before we answer the question, how did Joseph resist temptation? I want to tell you a story. Back when Pastor Predeepin and I were dating, um, we were like, had been dating for a little while. We kind of came to a rough patch in our relationship, you know, and I know many of us have been there before. And I thought that I was just, I was just like, you know what, I think I just need to break up with this guy. Like, I, I think it's over. I mean, spoiler alert, we got back together, if you didn't know. But... <laughs> I just thought, you know, and pretty even, you know, he was a young man. He was, he was growing up. He was becoming mature. And at the time, he was, like, living under the, he was living in a friend's house and, like, you know, didn't have money and didn't have a car, didn't have clothes. I was just kind of like, I don't know that this guy's really ready for a relationship, okay? Uh, so I, I just was like, I don't know. So I went to Kansas. We were in Colorado. He stayed in Colorado. I went to Kansas to go spend time with my family. I was just trying to regroup. What do I do? God, what do I do? I was processing with my family and my sister and my mom and things like that. And I'll never forget, I was sitting at my sister's house and I get a text message. And the text message is from a boy, a guy that I used to date. And this guy was literally awful for me. We had the most toxic, awful, dysfunctional relationship. He was the kind of guy that was incredibly manipulative. He knew exactly what to say. And I never made good choices when I was with this guy. I always left heartbroken. It was just an awful, awful relationship. And I had finally gotten away from that for a few years and I was somewhere else. Well, I get back and this text, I look at this text and this guy has um, texted me and he says, hey, I heard you're in town. Why don't you come by and say hi? And I will never forget my sister saw the text and she said, don't you dare go over there because she knew how bad this guy was in my life. And I had cut things off. I had separated. And I knew that she knew that if I, if I even entertained this, I would get sucked right back into this really toxic situation. And so I was thinking about it and I, I just decided, you know what? I started justifying. I was like, you know, I can say hi. It's fine. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm just going to say hi. And so I got in my car. I was literally about to go to this guy's house, and I get a phone call from my dad. And my dad's on the line, and he said, hey, Amrita, there's a package here for you. It just got delivered to the house. And I said, well, what's the package? He goes, well, it's 12 roses, 12 red roses. And I said, what? And I said, well, who are they from? He goes, I don't know. He goes, he goes, you want me to open the card? I was like, open the card. I need to know who this is from. And he opened the card, and these 12 beautiful roses were from Pradeepan. And I will never forget sitting in my car, and I'm telling you what, I snapped out of that temptation. Girl, flowers can do a lot for girls, okay, guys? <laughs> they, they are powerful. And I literally, I, 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 I seriously, I snapped, I like jolted myself. I was like, what was I about to do? Oh my gosh. Like, I, did, I just realized that if I would have gone over to that guy's house, and if things had gone the way that they had gone for years and years and years, I would have ended up cheating on the guy that I was actually still with. And even if I would have broken up with Pradeepan, I wouldn't have wanted to broke up with him and then admit to him that I cheated while I was at home. And I had this temptation. And I'm telling you what, I believe, truly, I believe that it was the Spirit of God that delivered me from evil and kept me away from that temptation. 
And so this morning, I think we have to recognize that we all struggle with temptation. In the past few years, things have been really difficult. I have seen husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends and single people begin to operate in their life in survival mode. And when we operate in survival mode, we begin to treat each other pretty badly. We're, in, we're, we're in our, using our coping mechanisms all the time. And so we're the worst to the people in our family. We go to work. We're great. We come home. We treat our spouse like terrible. We treat our kids terrible. We, are, we fall into this temptation. We fall into the temptation of not actually dealing with conflict. Some of you may struggle with this. You're about to have a conflict conversation in your marriage, but you're the person that can't handle it, and you walk out of the room. It's temp- you're just tempted to just leave. and just leave this. It'll just figure itself out. It'll work itself out. This is our temptation. Some of us, we have the temptation to be lazy and apathetic in our marriage. You know what? This guy or this girl, they have to love me forever. They already decided, so I don't really need to try anymore. I don't need to put any more effort into it. This is a temptation that we face. We we, uh, face the temptation of projecting our feelings, our emotions, onto someone else. I'm going to tell you what projecting actually means because this happens a lot. Projecting means taking unwanted emotions or traits you don't like about yourself and attributing them to someone else we oftentimes begin to project ourselves onto other people. The other temptation is, I think those of us that have been married for a while, is to just believe that the grass is greener on the other side. And we begin to entertain thoughts like, you know, I kind of wish I was with that person instead. Like, I don't know if I should even marry this person. You know, we just start to entertain ideas we never thought that we would. And I think the reality is that we have to be honest about is, is that we vastly overestimate our ability to resist temptation. We think that we got this. That's not something I would ever be tempted with. It's fine. I can handle it. And we overestimate our ability to resist temptation. Okay, there's actually a technical term for this. This is not just a Christian conversation temptation. There's a technical word for this, and it's this, restraint bias. Restraint bias is the tendency for people to overestimate their ability to control impulsive behavior. I'm going to read a little bit about this to you. The restraint bias refers to our tendency to overestimate the level of control we have over our impulsive behaviors. These urges typically come from visceral impulses such as hunger, drug cravings, fatigue, and sexual arousal. This exaggerated view of our own restraint can cause us to make poor decisions and put ourselves in scenarios where our restraint is tested. We then have a greater chance of slipping and going against our prior commitments. The restraint bias can cause significant unintended negative outcomes. So what's really happening here when we overestimate? When we underestimate the power of our impulses, we overestimate our own control over them. The scripture actually talks about this. 1 Corinthians 10 says, so if you think you can, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. We overestimate our ability to resist temptation. We got to be honest. We got to have some honest conversations with ourselves about what is tempting us and the fact that we struggle to resist them. And so Joseph, Joseph was just, like I said, incredible at resisting temptation. I believe that there are three things that we can learn from him. And I I tried to make these points easy for you in this series so you can remember them. So today we're going to talk about the three R's, okay? Joseph, he refused he remembered and he ran. The first one is this, Joseph refused. Verse seven, after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me, verse eight, but he refused. I think that we'll make a great mistake if we sit here and we think, well, Joseph was just more spiritual than everyone. Joseph was just stronger than I am. I mean, he can just sort of handle things. You know what? No. Joseph was a human being just like the rest of us. What we have to understand is Joseph refused. And the way that he refused and the reason he was able to refuse this temptation was because he was ready. Everybody say ready. There's a bonus R word for you this morning, okay? He was ready. How many of you have given into a temptation that you regret? Raise your hand. Some of you are tempted to lie right now. God is watching you. Okay. And I want to tell you this, chances are that you gave in to that temptation because you weren't ready. You didn't see it coming. Or if you did see it coming, you just weren't ready to handle it and not be able to, to be able to resist the temptation. So I want to ask you this, what if we could make the decision right now to pre-decide what we're going to do so we don't even get to that temptation? What if there was a possibility for us to decide today, right now, that I'm not even going to get close to that temptation because I can be ready now? 
Lots of times what we do is we wait. It's like going to the grocery store hungry, right? And we give in to temptation. I have so many chocolate covered almonds at my house because I went to Costco hungry. Those are so good. And so we have to understand that we can make a decision right now. Here's a question we need to ask ourselves. Why would I resist a temptation in the future if I have the power to eliminate it today? How do we do this? Well, we have to move the line. Everybody say move the line. Move the line. Okay, we're going to pre-decide what our boundaries are. And I have an illustration for us this morning. This is an illustration that I actually uh, took from a pastor named Craig Grishel, but it's so good. I wanted to share it with you. And so I have Rachel here, and she's creating this red line. Okay, what does red mean? Red means stop. Red means stop. I've been teaching my daughter. Red means stop. Green means go. Yellow means slow. Okay, so red means stop. So this is what we normally do when we're dealing with temptation. We, when we're, we're going into these areas and these modes of temptation, we like to walk right up to this line, don't we? And so this is the line. It's like this. It's like, I'm not going to eat the chocolate cake. I'm just going to smell it. I'm not going to eat it. I'm on a diet. I'm just, I'm just going to. And then oh, all of a sudden, you're over here and you ate the whole chocolate cake, <laughs> right? We, we go right up to this line. We tell our spouse, listen, I promise you, I'm not going to come home drunk again. I promise you. And then what do you do? You go out for happy hour every single day with your coworkers. You go spend time at bars and you can't even resist the temptation because you have walked right up to this temptation. We have people in our marriages who walk right up this, this temptation. I am developing a harmless relationship with this person. It just started with texting. We kind of message each other. All of a sudden, we've crossed over into some inappropriate things. And all of a sudden, you become the person who had an affair on your spouse. You never saw it coming. Because we walk right up to this line. We tell our husband, stop leaving your clothes on the, tell someone, stop leaving your clothes on the floor. And you just pick them up over and over and over and over again until you snap. And then you just throw them all away. <laughs> this is not a story from my personal life. We like to go right up to the line. And when we go right up to the line, we get in trouble. Listen, my dad, he was a pilot, okay? And when he flew, he never said, how close can I get to this mountain and to this tower without hitting it? Right? He never said, how little gas can I put fuel in this airplane before we run out of gas? You never go right up to that line in those situations, right? And so this is what happens when we know that something is really dangerous. We need to move the line. Everybody say, move the line. Move the line. The enemy is after us. So because we know that, we're going to move the line. So I'm going to have Rachel come back up here. And she's going to make another line right here. Come all the way over here. Awesome. So we're going to move the line. What does it mean to move the line? Like I said, the enemy is coming after us. Well, this is what it means. It means that instead of waiting and coming right close to this line, we are going to back here, make a pre-choice, a pre-decision about what we're going to do so we don't even get there. When I was uh, about to marry Pastor Pretty, and I said, listen, I won't marry a guy who's not willing to go to counseling if we ever have trouble. Because I know that married couples have trouble. And I know it's hard to live with me. So I knew that someday we'd probably be in counseling. But we didn't wait until we had marriage troubles. We decided way back here. This is a decision that we will make for our family. Some of you are struggling and addicted to pornography. And instead of deciding to go right up to that line and put yourself in that place again, you need to download some software on your device and you need to let it alert someone a friend that loves and cares about you and you need to decide right now this is your new line do you get it we need to move the line we don't have to wait till we're right over here God has given us every ability to resist temptation and one of them is to come over here move the line and to be ready and when you are ready you can res refuse like Joseph did and so this morning I want to tell you if you don't move the line you'll cross the line when we move the line, we decide before the temptation can even present itself how we're going to honor God and those we love. Doing this isn't restricting, it's liberating. I think sometimes we're like, oh, I just don't want to have to deal with all these rules. Christians always have to deal with, listen, these are not rules. This is liberating. This is going to give you an opportunity to be able to live your life. 
Move the line. Decide ahead of time. It is powerful. Now listen, I want to tell you how Jesus fits into this situation. Hebrews 4.15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. High priest is Jesus. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Listen, church. I'm not here to condemn you this morning. I'm here to tell you that God in flesh, Jesus Christ himself, went through every temptation that you have ever uh, struggled with, and he resisted them. He has empathy. He's not up there just waiting for you to move or go over the line and make a sin and whatever. He's not up there doing that. He's a loving God. He's saying, listen, I get it. I empathize with you. I want to help you. I've given you my spirit so that you can move the line so that you don't have to just give in over and over and over to temptation. Jesus understands. I love that we serve a God who understands and has compassion and empathy for us. For those of you that are sitting here today just feeling guilty, feeling stuck in a temptation, I need you to know that Jesus cares, and he is empathizing with you, and he will help you. Amen? Uh, this was C.S. Lewis quote says this, Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation means. The only complete realist. We don't have to be on the defense. God has placed us in an offensive place. We are in the driver's seat, okay? He has given us everything we need to do this. All right. So Joseph, he remembered. He, Joseph refused, and then Joseph remembered, okay? Joseph, what we have to understand here, and I want to give you some context, is that he, for 11 years, like I said before, resisted this woman and all of her advances toward him. And I began to think, what in the world? Why was this woman after him for 11 years. What in the world is going on? Well, I did dug a little bit deeper into the scriptures and into the context of the situation. And what we need to understand is this. Potiphar, who was uh, the, the right-hand person for Pharaoh, okay, Joseph's working for Potiphar. Potiphar, what they would do with people who were that high in leadership working with Pharaoh is that they would actually castrate them so that they would show their full devotion to Pharaoh, Okay. And so what happens is these people became eunuchs. And as we look at this, we begin to realize, wait a minute, that means that Potiphar and his wife possibly had a purely ceremonial arrangement with no sexual activity, with no sexual intimacy. And we begin to look at that and we just think, wait a minute, well, does that change the story a little bit? Does that change our perspective? How is that fair that she is married to someone who works for Pharaoh and never gets any action? How is that fair? You know, I mean, Joseph even was like sold into slavery. He could have been like, God, where are you? You know, I mean, he's now in a place of influence. He has control. He could have literally done whatever he wanted and nobody would have found out. But does it make it right? Does it make it right to have an affair? With, against her husband. And you know what? This is where things get dangerous for us. We begin to justify our decisions like I did with that guy back when I was dating Pastor Pradeepin. We begin to justify them. And, and all of a sudden, our highest priority begins to be ourself. And we give in to the desires of our flesh. We give in to the desires of Everything that we need, we just go and get, and we get it fulfilled. We use our disappointments to justify our disobedience our disobedience. I had a friend who um, was, it, she was recently married and she, uh, they were really going through a hard thing. Like it was like they were, they were first married. It was just really difficult. This was sort of the environment that she was in. And we worked together at a Christian organization. We worked in cubicles right next to each other. She was a really good friend. And all of a sudden I noticed that she um, would go to this VP's office, uh, this guy who was 20 years older than her. He had, uh, you know, he, he was a leader in this organization. He was the VP, and I noticed that she would go to his office and spend a ton of time there, and they would shut the door. And every day this would happen. She would spend more and more time in this guy's office. And then I started to notice that whenever she left the office, a few minutes later, he walked out of the office. And then I noticed in the mornings that she would come into the office, and he would come into the office pretty much right after her. And I began to wonder, you guys, I wonder if something is going on here. She's married. He's married with two kids. He's 20 years older than her. And I'm like, no, this can't be happening. This, you know, I just didn't want to like accuse somebody of something, right? And I was like, no way. Well, all of a sudden, one day, she gets called into our boss's office, and uh, she comes out of our boss's office 20 minutes later with tears streaming down her face. She's packed up all of her stuff, and she's leaving. And then 
A few minutes later, he gets called in the boss's office. Same thing happens. He goes back to his office, gathers all of his things, and he's leaving, and he looks terrible. And I found out that our boss had figured out through some email exchanges that these two were having an affair. And I'll never forget sitting with my friend and talking to her, and I'll never forget. She said, how did I get here? How did I get, how did I become the person? I never thought, we overestimate. We overestimate our ability to resist temptation. How did I get here? I was never supposed to be a person that would ever do this to my husband. And sure enough, this guy kicked her out of the house. Thankfully, over, over time, they were able to restore and forgive their marriage. But it was very difficult. And we find ourselves saying, I never thought I would be the one to fill in the blank. And I felt so bad for her. But you know what? We have to realize that Joseph, he resisted temptation because he remembered a few things. He actually remembered three things. He remembered that Potiphar had given him so much influence and so much power over his house. The, at the end of the day, Joseph thought, you know what? When no one else ca take, took care of me, when I was sold into slavery, Potiphar stood up for me. He hired me. He brought me in. I'm not going to go against him. He's my guy. He remembered that. He remembered what he had to lose, which is his job, which is this place that he lived the second thing that uh, he remembered is that Potiphar's wife was Potiphar's wife. He, he was not somebody who could take advantage of this woman because she belonged to him. In fact, Joseph honored Potiphar's marriage. He was honoring. He believed in their marriage. And then the third thing that Joseph remembered is that he remembered God. Verse 9 says, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And my friend who ended up having an affair with this guy, she forgot a few things. She forgot what she could lose. A husband who loves her. A marriage that just started and yeah, was in trouble. But the ability to build a life with someone, she, she forgot that. She forgot that she has friends that she can talk to that would love her through her temptations. And not going to, she isolated herself. She, she forgot. She forgot that she has people around her that could help her. And she forgot God. She wanted to live her life for Jesus. But this temptation got her. It gripped her. It got her. So we forget these things. And Joseph remembered. When you remember God, you can be confident of this. Christ in you is stronger than the wrong desire in you. Some of you need to believe that deep into your hearts. Christ is great in you. You have everything that it takes to overcome temptation in your life. Amen? All right. So Joseph refused. Joseph remembered. And lastly, Joseph ran. Verse 11, one day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. I mean, this woman was relentless. She waited until no one else was around, right? No one else was around and she literally grabbed his coat. But you know what Joseph did? Because he didn't wait to go all the way up to the line. He had already pre-decided. He had already made sure that he would be able to run. He ran. He got out of there. He refused. He knew that he was not going to even go close to that. And I don't know what happened. He probably went out in his underwear because she still had his cloak. And I don't know what guys wore into their clothes back then. Okay, but he left. It didn't matter. He was not going to sleep with her. And he just kept making it clear over and over and over to her. In fact, at one point in the scripture, it says that Joseph, he just wouldn't even put himself around her anymore. He literally just started uh, completely avoiding her. And we can do that. God has given us the, be, uh, the ability to do that, to refuse, to be ready. You can be ready. We are on the offense here. He knew it was better to have a good name than a good coat. You know, my husband has lots of coats. You all have seen them. Denim after denim after denim after denim. But you know what? My husband believes that it is better to have a good name than a good coat. He would forfeit all of them because he wants to honor God. And Joseph wanted to honor God. He knew that if she grabs, I run. If she comes toward me, I run. If she finds me because he's avoiding her, I run. He had already pre-decided. What environments are more tempting to you than others? The Bible never said to manage temptation. It says to flee it. And Joseph ran. He took off. You need to ask yourself the question, what are some of the more tempta temp tempting environments that I'm in? I, want, I think some of you need to leave today. You need to talk to your spouse. You need to talk to a friend. You need to talk to somebody. And you need to just confess and say, you know what? When I'm in this situation, it tempts me to do blank. 
Ask yourselves that. I want this place to be a community where we don't just come and put our happy faces on and feel all put together. We all have this, okay? We are all human. And if you're someone this morning that feels stuck in your temptation, you don't know how to overcome it, I want you to know that you are part of a body of believers. You are part of a a community that wants you to be successful in your life with God. And so we can be that community for each other, right? And so as you leave today, even as you think about it, Over the week, what is this temptation? Know that God is fighting for you. God is fighting for you. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. He will provide a way out. This is good news, my friends. God has provided a way out for you. He has provided a way out for me. You don't have to do it in and of your own strength. When I thought about my friend who had an affair, I thought about this um, quote by C.S. Lewis. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. A man who gives into temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. Isn't that wild? God has given us a way out. And we can trust that this morning. This is a spiritual battle. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. You're going to need the community of the church to overcome temptation, to be different, to honor God with your life. Amen? So what did Joseph do? Joseph refused. He refused. He was ready. He refused. He had already predecided. And Joseph, he remembered. He remembered what Potiphar had done to him, done for him. He remembered that Potiphar's wife was Potiphar's wife. And he remembered God. He remembered that he actually ultimately wants to please God with his life. And I know many of you do too. He remembered. And Joseph, he ran. We need to run from temptation. And God will give us the ability to do that. He has already given us an escape, right? He will make a way for us. You know, I want to close today by actually reading uh, together and praying out loud the Lord's Prayer. And when we get to that part about temptation, I want some of you in that moment to just, I want you to just think to yourself, I need help. Whatever temptation comes to your mind. You don't have to say it out loud. You don't have to, but just in your heart, you just, you need to be somebody who's humble enough to say, I need help, right? Right? So when we get to that part, I just want you to think, I I need help. I need to be honest and have an honest conversation with myself about this. So we've got the Lord's Prayer right up here on the screen right now. And I want us to just pray this all together. We're going to read it right now all together out loud. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you have given us an escape route. You, God, have given us everything that we need to resist temptation. Lord, for every marriage, for every dating couple, for every single person that is struggling with temptation, that is struggling, that feels like they're trapped, they're in sin, it's leading to death. God, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus that by your spirit, you would come and you would bring that escape route. You would show us, God, how to be a community of believers that would help one another. Lord, I thank you. I thank you, God, that we can even decide right now what we are going to do so we don't have to face that temptation again. Lord, help us to be honest with ourselves. Help us not to overestimate our ability to resist temptation, Lord Jesus. It doesn't matter if we're pastors or church leaders. No one is above temptation. So, God, we're asking for your strength. We thank you for your empathy and your compassion. That you understand, Jesus. You know exactly what it's like to go through these temptations. And so, Lord, we surrender our lives to you. We ask that you would come. For those of us that feel so guilty, so shameful about giving into temptation, I'm asking right now, Jesus, that you would lift shame off of people. You would lift guilt off. Lord, let let there be a holy conviction in our lives. 
Thank you, God, for a way out. Thank you for making a way, an escape route for us. In Jesus' name, amen.